So today we're going to be talking about chapter two of um, efficient R, which is about um, efficient setup. So like your environment, your uh, you know whether you use our studio, that kind of thing. Um, and I pulled out some learning objectives based on some stuff that they kind of already had somewhat tagged in the learning objective kind of style. Uh, that when we finish this, we should be able to use monitoring to identify bottlenecks in our hardware code. Um, we'll be able to keep our, our installation and packages up to date. Uh, we'll make use of our studio's auto completion capabilities and shortcuts. Uh, we'll modify our, our profile and our environment and uh, know what to put where. And then we'll talk about using uh, BLAST if our, our number cruncher is too slow. And feel free to you know break in at any moment with a uh, conversation. So the first thing they talk about was uh, system modifying, uh, monitoring rather, to like identify if your code is memory limited versus processor limited. So will will it do any good to paralyze it? Basically, um, <laughs> playing with this made me like really appreciate uh, working on a ded dedicated server because. It's really hard to see what impact my code was having over time because the monitors on my computer were seeing, you know, oh, you're, you switched to a new song on the music you were playing or, you know, anything else that's happening on uh, my laptop. I tend to have a bunch of stuff happening. Um, so I thought that was kind of just interesting to play with. Like, oh, okay, yeah, um, isolating servers is also useful in order to monitor because you can't really see over time. Now you can see, like if you watch the R process, you can see percent, uh, this is on a Windows machine, but um, you know it's similar on different machines. You can see the percent of RAM that's being used or the percent of CPU that's being used or um, number of CPUs that are being hit, things like that. Um, but watching it over time and trying to like be able to see, okay, what part of that was this particular process that was pretty, uh, impossible. Um, and then the parallel code, they did talk about it, but it's not parallel on Windows. So if you do play with their examples, um, just know that this particular example doesn't actually uh, parallelize on Windows. Um, and the other thing is, this was like, I, I would think I was looking at the, the date changes and this was last updated in like 1990, or I mean, 2017. I'm not sure. Well, number one, they changed some things in base R about um, like large numbers, handling large numbers. If you don't actually change anything in the middle, it kind of thinks of it as, you know, like if you do one to a thousand, that's the same size in RAM as one to 10 until you actually look at the stuff in the middle. Like it's like, oh, it's just, it's this range. Um, so I think some of that was impacted here that this wasn't actually as large of a data set as it was when they wrote the book. Um, and then also just, uh, you know, every year machines get more insane. And so mine, I've got just stupid amounts of RAM in my laptop because I work with a lot of really like large uh, objects. Uh, so like it was hard to make this show up <laughs> as anything significant. Does anyone have any thoughts? observations around these parts. All right. Um, they talked a bit about updating R and packages. Um, a couple of things that stood out to me in there. I've seen like, I've seen a lot of talk about the install R package for Windows. Um, I guess it makes it slightly easier than going to the website to download things, but I don't, I don't know. I am very cautious about automatically updating packages. Um, I install a lot of packages in the course of working on R4DS things. And usually what I do is when I switch to a new version, I don't install new packages until I actually use them. I don't just automatically upgrade all my packages. Uh, it serves as a way for me to kind of clean out <laughs> the noise. Um, but to make that possible, uh, I do agree with the the good practice of at the top of any script, put, you know, load the packages that you're going to use. Even if you reference them using the colon colon, I still library them at the top 
in uh, in anything that I don't know anything where that kind of makes sense, so that I can see what packages I used. Um, even if it's in like if it's in a um, our markdown, I might put that into a block that I don't actually evaluate, but it's still there, so I can see the list of packages that are used. Um, and then something crazy in this section, I thought that they talked about was putting update packages ask equals false into your .r profile. It's an interesting idea that anytime you start an R session, it will update all of your R packages. Um, I restart my R session fairly often, and it feels like this is, you know, it has to do a check that would be a little bit of a thing. So I haven't tried that. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about that. Yeah, I definitely, I think, want to chime in here. And I yeah. wouldn't say, yeah, I, I'm not, I, I don't think I would be a fan of the third one. Um, I definitely, like, I follow the second one for, for a while <laughs> now. I've heard about installer, or I think probably I looked it up myself. So because um, this package basically allows you to upgrade, update your R from within your R studio, which I like the idea. And I think that's why I was... I started first started looking about it. I don't I don't know if there's something similar for Mac. Um, would love to know about it. But uh, coming down to updating packages, right? So especially when you're working on bigger projects, um, I have practically run into an issue where something you know this one whole report that I was working on on all by myself on my system, then we had to uh, port it to the server. Um, and everything that was working fine on my system with all the packages, you know, that I had, it still wouldn't run on that new system. And that was, you know, when I had frozen all the packages, versions and, and whatnot. Yeah, and even by like manually matching all the package versions. And then I, I don't know if you remember, uh, John, but I had asked this question when I was going through the situation was, what the hell was going on? I had no idea. So I had literally like copied everything with, from using version info or session info that function and then copied everything in Excel, matched every single, um, you know, package and package version in my system and in that other system that I was trying to port it to. Um, and then that also didn't serve. So then uh, I what I ended up doing uh, I mean, as a next step, I actually ran few bits of, um, you know, my code, then did that version info and then matched <laughs> it again in that system. And that was crazy. And then only thing that saved the day was RN. Um, then I, I yep. reviewed Kevin Ushi's 20 minute, uh, I think it was our conference, uh, our studio conf talk uh, twice. And then, you know, it was basically <laughs> these three simple functions that you have to, um, start with you lock your system and you know everything all the package versions and everything is going to be um sort of stabilized and then you make sure that that lock is uh, taken into that other system also and that's where you unlock it so basically you're yep. putting all the version all the packages physically in a folder into that <laughs> system so that it runs fine and I don't know how many days I had spent figuring this thing <laughs> out. So definitely no updating packages, even while things are running. So you, you, know, you will end up in a situation where I ran something today, tomorrow I finished that project, it's working fine. And I come back to it you know, next week and things start breaking because it, it auto-updated my packages, no way. Yeah, so I mean, it, it this goes back to um, a thing that came up when we had Jenny Bryan at the R Packages uh, book club like she came in to answer some questions and it's the if you are a if you primarily develop packages or you primarily like use packages update packages ask equals false might be useful to me because I mostly work on packages writing packages um and you always want to be you know you want to be testing against what what you will be tested against and mm -hmm. so in that case, I can see it maybe making sense versus like the RN, you know, if you're working on scripts, if you're working on like anything other than a package, basically locking versions of everything is super useful. It's still like, it's still useful to update packages when you can, like when you can afford yeah. to, mm -hmm. but doing it automatically all the time. I just, I thought this was crazy. 
like yeah. when I saw this, it's like, oh, I even yeah, and then and, yeah. and then that too with ask is equal to false, meaning you will never in your life figure out why what, what's yeah. going on. Like, yeah, right? It, yeah, it'll it so just difficult to track it back. Um, so it won't ask, but I think it would still show you that it happened. Like, I think you would see the update happening, uh-huh. but uh, yeah, it would just do it. And so, yeah, that one, um, thought that was really interesting. I do like, um, install R has a function to like check if you're using the latest version of R. I could imagine putting that into, into my R profile just when like, when uh, Studio first loads, you can have certain mm-hmm. things run. And so having it tell me, hey, there's a new version of R, I could maybe, <laughs> um, yeah. It looks like you have some thoughts, Flores. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> but I think, but my my approach is um, is dual. It is uh, on the one hand, if I load R, just uh, just R or just R Studio, it's um, the latest version of R, and well, I do um, update all packages, but in a manual fashion. So I want to have it supervised. So uh, I want to see if something goes wrong. Uh, for example, uh, some, some packages may need compiling, for example. So I want to have an oversight, but I do like to have everything up to date, uh, bleeding edge even you could say, in some cases perhaps, but it will only be used um, for new scripts, new packages, uh, then which are indeed checked with the latest R packages. But then projects that, that evolve, that develop over time and which you don't want to update everywhere each time, of course, that you will uh, implement uh, RNF. And uh, I, I saw it was not in the book yet, probably because RNF at the time of writing wasn't yet uh, at that stage, um, as it is now, it is a uh, pack rat is mentioned. But um, so that that's uh, my approach, actually. So our yeah. packages and also simple scripts and well, just um, temporary experiments. And so mm-hmm. it's always with the latest R packages. And I don't care uh, about <laughs> the versions. But at the moment, it's getting more serious. Then then it's important to have it also for reproducibility. It is very important to to make the R versions uh, fixed. Yes, the, the well, and, versions. Yeah. yeah, it is like you do want to update because uh, you know that's how you get bug fixes. And so you might have some error that you don't know about if you're just working on old versions. But I I don't know having more control over it makes sense. So. I, I could totally see, like, I have um, my own, like, personal package that kind of wraps, use this and does some things. And when I create a new, or start a new project, I could imagine running update packages as part of that, um, just building that into the script, because at that point, I want to be using the latest packages um, before, like, if it's going to be something that I am uh, working with RN with it, I would want to update all the packages before like setting up the, the uh, RN environment. So um, yeah, I just, I, I, it was an interesting part of the chapter because it had some things that I like kind of violently disagreed with, but it made me think about things. So yeah, but I, yeah. I also rose my bros when I saw uh, it's, uh, put into our profile so i also yeah thought, well it's <laughs> on the one hand it sounds cool <laughs> uh, to always have all updated versions but that has its drawbacks of course uh, yeah because primarily you, you may miss it that it happens uh, for example and also it takes some time it can take right. some time uh, yeah i i could see maybe putting well so like i said when you start a new project having that automatically run update packages I, I could i might play around with that for myself and then maybe on like you know wednesday afternoons or something like you know if i restart r and it's in this certain window something like that um just to make sure that it's checking every once in a while but uh yeah it was it was interesting <laughs> put it that way all right 
so they went into some stuff about our startup. Um, I don't run R from the command line that often, but then again, I run um, like uh, GitHub Actions a fair amount. So thinking about that kind of stuff of, you know, a lot of this stuff, you probably want vanilla in a lot of cases, except uh, environment. I, I use uh, our environment for setting, you know, variables for various things in packages. Um, actually, not so much on GitHub Actions, but for Shiny apps. Um, and speaking of, so there's our environment is the file for setting uh, environment variables. Um, that's useful for, you know, you can put like uh, passwords and uh, API keys, mostly that kind of thing in there. They talk a little bit about how, the different levels of that, that you can have one in a, a project and that overrides your general one. Then technically there's one in like the base installation of R. Um, and then likewise, there's R profile. That's where you can run just any arbitrary R code. Um, I have a fair number of things in mind. That I don't remember if they went into it in the book, but you know, it's careful or yeah, they did a little bit that you want to be careful that anything you run in there doesn't like, won't make your code unreproducible. Like I tend to run, like I library use this in my R profile because I'm not using use this in my code. I'm using use this to generate code. Um, and so that's safe, but you know, don't library tidyverse in your R profile because then you you won't remember to library something and your code won't be reproducible. Um, the book, what they forgot to teach you about R, we had a book club around that and we have videos and notes and stuff that uh, we go into like, <laughs> that's kind of the, uh, like the use this um, book club kind of, and it's lots of use this e things. And so um, highly recommend that. Oh, one that I did not know this, this continue option. Um, what this overrides is by default, if you like, you know, if you type options parentheses and then enter, it'll go to a new line that has plus at the front and you can just say, you know, space, space, or whatever number of spaces you want as the continue. And that way you can copy and paste. Like that's all it's for, but it, I thought that was a useful thing to know about because that plus always drives me crazy, um, especially if I'm trying to demonstrate something. But what does it do actually? So here, let me, I'll have to reshare. Um, oops, I want to. Oh, did you mean um, so when you have parentheses missing and it gives you a plus? Yeah, so yes. So uh, when it goes to the new line, it puts the plus on the left side. Here, I'm uh -huh. trying to get a project that I can show to show off. Um, like it, it, what is that? So if you do this okay. one, uh, options continue is equal to space, then that plus is replaced by this space. Y yes. So let me. Um, uh, I need to turn something off, and then I will share my screen. Um, let's see. Yeah. So if I do this, is that ready? Okay. Um, I need to come over here and say stop share, and then, of course, it rearranges all my windows because. It's annoying. Okay. So this is my our studio, and if you say you know uh, that, this is with the default settings. Um, I can be sneaky about it, uh, and it puts those pluses, and that's oh. annoying for typing. But now, since I typed that. Um, it just puts space space instead, uh -huh. um, which just just for copy paste. That's so much easier or so much cleaner. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah. now, when if you, I when you read on your code, yeah. something that ran successfully, you know, copy it to your script. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and just and most it's pretty much purely for taking this and then going and putting it into R for DS. That's why this was useful to me. Yeah. <laughs> that. I do this all the time where I'm just playing with something in the console in order to, to try to answer someone's question. Uh -huh. um, and it'll end up being, you know, like I copy and paste their code. And so it ends up with having 
pluses in it or something. Um, yeah. And so I just, I liked that one. I, I had no idea that was a thing. So that yeah. one's in my R profile so, now. <laughs> yeah, but then generally for, for what you said, for copying thing, something that has worked, what I do is I just go into the console and do up arrow, I sort of like going back into the history and just bring up the same code again. And then I copy that. Yeah. Um, that way basically you don't, then you don't get pluses because you've not run that piece yet. Um, yes, but I like to be able to just get the thing that I just ran without having to, yeah. you know, think about it. So, um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I like that one. I, I have implemented that one. Um, and then they, they talked about this dot last, you can put that in your R profile and it'll run at the end of the session. I haven't done anything with that yet, but I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, it reminds me I don't, of that. Of what? Um, SAS. SAS oh, um, okay. It, although it's more of, you know, in that data step. Um, and you, you can choose to do something with the first element or with the last element. No. Uh, yeah. They also use a dot first and dot last. <laughs> uh, I had one question on the command line piece. Um, sure. Do these know, you know, all of these options? Does it also, um, what's the right way to ask it? So, does it also uh, can you can you replicate this? So you know you you have this um, uh, global options and then what's it called? One second, let me see. <laughs> when you go to your tools, project options and global options, there you can you know. So one of those things that probably Jenny Bryan suggests is you know always uncheck the restore data dot our data yep. into specific startup so does does these does it you know is it the same thing I guess is what uh, I, I I am pretty sure those options in our studio are telling our studio to run with those options like I think it's exactly the same thing I'm not a hundred percent sure but I'm pretty sure um that and yeah I thought I guess they talk about it somewhere else because I, I mentioned the there's a use this command to basically replicate those, which must be on the next tab. Um, so speaking of, yeah, <laughs> use this, use blank slate. That's that will go in there, and that's the equivalent of going into global options and uh, um, unchecking the restore our data into workspace at startup and telling it to never save the dot r data uh i'm a fan of that i like i agree with that because i don't want anything just left over from the last time i was using r to confuse me so i like that um yeah i don't remember what they actually said in the book at this point because these were these are the things that i thought i think impor are important about working with our studio um a recent command uh hotkey that i learned that i ran it whilst I was sharing my screen and someone was like, whoa, how the heck did you do that? Is control alt B. That'll run everything in a script to the point that your cursor is. So control shift enter runs like the whole script. Control enter runs just the line you're on, but control alt B will run down to the line you're on. Uh, so what is the Mac equivalent of this? I assume like command option B. Um, and you'll run down to that point. Uh, it's, let's see if I can find what it's called in the uh, keyboard shortcuts. Um, um, I don't know, uh, I'll try to find it. Oh, uh, uh, run from beginning to line in the execute section of the keyboard shortcuts. So I, I find that one super useful. Um, because as I'm playing with things, that can uh, that comes in a lot. And then they talk a lot in the chapter and you know in our um, what they forgot to teach you about R and lots of places that just use projects that makes your life easier. Um, our studio projects are really great. So if you're yes, using yes, our studio, I would, I, I would <laughs> yeah. probably if, if I were to make the slide, I would say use projects and number of times till you fill this up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's like every other line in the bullet point should be use projects. Yes. That's like, that's how to get 
uh, yeah, I, I learned this the power now, of our surveyor. Yeah, now I just I just start everything. I start when I start my new project or you know anything. I just start with a new project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So I, I haven't used projects at this point. Oh. I I definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel like I, I probably should. Um, one thing I was curious about with it is, um, so for the stuff that I do, we put a lot of the stuff on GitHub. So we put like all of our scripts, but we yep. explicitly don't ever want to upload any data to GitHub. Mm -hmm. it, in projects, does that work? That works just as simply? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You, can, you can still use github with your projects and you can have your git ignore to i think git ignore also takes care of you know like slash data slash star where you can mention that anything under this folder should not be put into okay. github yeah. um yeah but our projects our projects is is basically it's, it's a different concept it's about <laughs> workflow management it's i guess parallel or different from mm -hmm. how github uh, integration works within R, so both of them can be uh, used together. Okay, so it's not affecting like the file structure; it's just how stuff within yeah. R is interacting. It, I mean, it it doesn't uh, affect this file structure in that each project is a directory a folder. Mm -hmm. um, the main thing I would say is uh, there's use this git vaccinate. Um, that, and, and then you can kind of see what it does and follow the, the advice from it, that that takes a bunch of files that you never want to update, upload to Git and sets up your local Git to, to ignore those files all in every project. And then that can kind of show you, oh, how do I ignore the other things in every project? Um, so you can follow along with kind of what it does. Um, uh, there was another thought. Oh, the other thing that's really useful if you're working with RStudio with projects is you can have different RStudios open with different projects yeah. loaded. Um, mm. And that just, it makes it like it says up at the top right what project you're in. It keep, makes it easy to keep track of what you're doing where. Um, in the icon, it shows you what project is open. So on like on a Windows okay. taskbar. And, and, and sort of in a reproducible way, it... Uh, I think, uh, like you said, you know, along with having multiple R studios open, it gives you, I think, or I think that's how it basically defines it. An R to an R project gives you a uh, isolated environment for yeah. this, you know, project that you're working on. For you, you will have a when you create a new R project, you will have a dot R proj file in that cent in that particular location, whichever you choose as your project. And by default, I think the name of the project also goes by that name. Yeah. Now, anything you do in that environment will not affect anything else or even your R, another R Studio instance without outside of that project. So, you know, it, it limits your scope of the environment. So, you know, the variables defines if even if you have same environment, you know, I'm sorry. So, for example, if you have X and Y is defined in this project and in this R Studio instance and also in another one, they will not impact each other. And that's, right. I guess, the biggest of uh, takeaways in that. Awesome. I'll start using them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Excellent. Oh. It's, yeah, it's, uh, there's there's a whole like section of the, um, what they forgot to teach you about our talking about projects and why and how to use them and some things to like take into account. So uh, this whole chapter, like, this chapter of this book is basically that other book slash workshop. Um, and so highly recommend these projects. All right. <laughs> so th this next section was this uh, BLAST, basic linear algebra system. I might have heard of this before, maybe like no idea though. Like this whole thing, uh, it's a potentially way faster for matrix math than whatever you have set up by default. Um, I started to play around with installation on Windows, but like they said, installation on Windows is painful. Um, and it was one of those things that was like written by tech bros that the help is like, all you have to do is, and then it's a wall of 
million steps that you have to do. Like, um, so I haven't tried it yet, but that's it's very intriguing that there's a whole other like it it's to make your computer better at being a computer, basically. <laughs> and I had no idea. Has anyone worked with this at all? Yeah. Yeah. Um so if you're working on Linux, uh oh you have? No, no, I I, uh, I didn't. Um I, I do work on Linux and I, I could probably do it rather e easily but i have been looking into the documentation of the r admin guides that they have referenced and i think there may be a little bit of contradiction between what okay. was in there and in the book it, that is um in the in the r admin guides it says um that you have to compile r and also certain packages of r uh for using an alternative blast hmm. while in the book they specifically put it put in a footnote and that they just installed in a linux uh, environment uh, a certain i think the open blast library and just yeah. ran again and then did a uh, comparison and it also uh, had a gain so I, I don't know uh, what uh, is going on there, but it's just it, from the Armin yeah. guides, um, I had the impression, well, it takes quite some management because you would need, according to that source, you would need to recompile R in a sense. So, um, yes. Huh. Okay. <laughs> um, I do know, like, uh was it flexiblast is a um a package but you need to set it up like you need to set up your r to use flexiblast so it's similar it was also yeah, in the guide yeah, yes. yeah yeah okay so okay that's good to know that um it's probably not super straightforward to do this um but, well maybe if we if I can believe what is in the book or what yeah. they say literally <laughs> is really what has been done, then that would seem rather it's easily. A, yeah, it it's also been a while since they did it, but I, it doesn't seem like they'd make it harder, you know. So I don't know. I haven't I haven't gone through this yet. Um, I might try it, uh, like on the Linux side of Windows as a first try because it won't break anything of what I normally use, but to see is this still a thing and is it worth it because i mean that you know the plots they showed in the book were huge differences for certain types of calculations so um anyway i just thought that was really interesting i had no idea uh but then i did try like i went down a rabbit hole of trying to get it set up and then it's like oh uh this wants me to use conda to set this up i i'm no that's not my thing so all right um but yeah so that's a that whole section i found intriguing and surprising like no idea um if i i don't know if i were working like we had a server at my little job that we would share for uh our work and slash a system for setting up more servers but we had like one that we worked on a lot doing that once to impact everybody feels like it could be useful if it's actually like, you know, reading up on it and if it's stable and it doesn't, it's not going to break things. Um, Cause it's weird, but it's interesting that it's uh, like way faster. And then other things, you know, it's, it was at least from everything I could see on it, it's either way faster or no impact. It's like, okay, it, you know, that's, that doesn't hurt anything then. So, um, Primarily a bit frightened by the fact that certain packages would need to be recompiled too. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. Uh, but like so if you're working it's, on it's, Linux, you're installing from source anyway. Well, actually, not anymore. <laughs> okay. Since uh, 
since uh, recently, or I think uh, last year, uh, Dirk Edelbuttel has uh, yep. made okay. uh, a, a repository with um, with compiled R packages for Ubuntu. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, there been there been packages for Ubuntu, and uh, it's great. Uh, I do install them at the system level. Actually, I don't rely gotcha. on the the connection, the bridge that they made, but. Uh, it, it is very useful um, because it, it uh, for the automatic updates they come with the system updates. Nice. Okay. Well, but yeah. Of course. So, it's, yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, that's a whole thing that um, obviously it was partially covered. Um, the idea of it was mentioned in this book, but obviously it didn't. It hadn't evolved to the point that it got to um, in the last year. Um. So, anyway. This is a thing that I I don't need it right now. I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but I, it was an intriguing idea. Um, yeah. oh, and maybe I don't. I, I can try. Uh, maybe I can try and see uh, if just the method that I use in the book, if I can uh, achieve something similar. Just to know. Uh, yeah. Or does R need to be recompiled or not? I could right. probably answer that question. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm intrigued to find out um, because it is, uh, you know, it was an interesting thing. May I get rid of that number? Ignore the number there because that is just because I didn't turn it off for one this one section. Um, they had this section on other R interpreters, and it was, I don't know, funny slash sad to go through it because everything they mentioned was nothing. There, it doesn't exist anymore, or it has stopped being developed. Um, Rengen it was the it's a Java uh, interpreter for R. It's technically not dead, but it's like in a closed. Uh, you know, it's used by some. Um, well, actually, no, that's right. This this link is someone has this uh, like R Studio written in Java, basically. And so, okay, um, so that is a a thing. But what it made me think of, so they were saying, oh, this is our studio, except it'll run in your browser using a Java virtual machine. And that led me to uh, that WebR is the new thing along those lines where it is R um, that runs entirely in your browser. This is uh, Bob Rudis, who's active on social media, and he's just like a um, useful, uh, or he's a uh, R. Um, he's a programmer who also works a lot in R. And so this was, uh, a, he put together a demo of this web R. Um, and so that, you know, all of this is running in my browser. Like there is no external runtime that it's talking to. It's, it's working 100% with it. Like you can embed it on a web page, and he made it an entire, um, uh, you know, interpreter. No, it's not perfect yet. Let's see. Is this is going to work. No, because I didn't run everything. But it's this was the same idea as they. Someone was working before on R in Java because they wanted to make an, a version of R that would run in your browser. Oops. And um, that's what this is. Oh, that's not good. Let's uh, move the rest of that. So, um, uh, yeah, okay, that's not quite perfectly working right now. So, um, I wonder if it's remembering if he wrote something in my, yeah, okay, that's interesting. I don't know how to reset it. It is, um, oh, there we go, through local storage. And, um, I want to see if I can get it to plot that he has this whole thing, but it doesn't seem, yeah, it's not actually working. So I think he might be actively breaking things in it. Um, or he might have notes that I have to actually take the time to read and I'm not going to do that in the middle of a book club. But anyway, so WebR is the thing that's like in, in the works, it's coming. There's a team at our studio or at least one person at our studio, um, probably a team actively working on it. And the idea is that you know you could have shiny apps that don't require a shiny server. They just 
to entirely run in the user's um, browser. Uh, there's a balance there. Like, you know, there are some shiny apps that I wouldn't want to send 100% of the stuff to the user's browser because then you can't protect secrets on the server side. Um, but there, there are things that would work great with WebR. So I'm, that's the new thing. That's the, the thing that's kind of in this uh, group. The, the rest of these were other, so the idea of other R interpreters is it, instead of the R that we all you know, know and love and install from uh, the main repositories, people have made their own versions of R that are compiled in different ways, written in different um, languages. I think Ro was the one that was written in uh, C++, but is now dead. Um, and all of them have messages like this at the top of their GitHub repos of, uh, we're not doing this anymore, but um, technically this PQR, which I can't remember what that one stands for, but it's not like dead, they just haven't worked on it. Um, and it's R 2.15, but then they built on top of that. So it's just like forked and it's separate from the normal version of R now. Um, and I do know also, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but there's uh, Jim Hester, who used to work at our studio, also had a little side project where he was making his own R interpreter, or at least he was talking about it. Um, not a thing like, you know, on the reproducibility front, this is like way off on the side of no, don't like this makes it if you're writing things to run in these different R interpreters. Now, in theory, the idea is that they're the, they would run the same as the core R interpreter just be faster. Uh, but I think part of the reason that these have died is there's been a lot of work in core R on speed. And so uh, they're like, oh, we don't need it anymore. Um, anyway, I thought that was an interesting section, but you could tell the age of the book because all their examples uh, were no longer relevant as far as I could tell. All right, and that is the end of the chapter. Um, does anyone have any other thoughts, comments, et cetera, about what was in here? Well, I'm giving you guys a chance to say, let's see, we'll click the, that button. Uh, all right, and so next week, it's probably more of what we're all here for. <laughs> efficient programming. And Priyanka will be leading us through that chapter. I'm looking forward to that one for sure. All right. I guess without further ado, uh, yes, yeah, thank you. And I will see you all on Slack. Bye. <laughs> oh, you were muted, Floris, but bye. <laughs>